like this. Um, if you would maybe turn with me, if you have your Bibles there, to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, the story of the woman at the well. And I'm not going to be looking in depth at this story. There's so much to be said about it. I just want to bring out one particular aspect of how Jesus, our Messiah, deals with the situation he's in. In John's gospel, John gives us an advantage. He tells us why he wrote John's gospel. At the end, he says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So when we look at John's gospel, we look that Jesus has come to offer life to all who will believe. This is why Jesus came, and this is why John's gospel is written. So we want to read it here in that context. And the basic reality as we look at this passage, we want to keep in mind is that Jesus is God's Messiah, and he will willingly give life to all who put their trust in him. So John chapter 4, I'm just going to start reading in verse 1. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea, went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you Ask me for a drink, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you are with now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. And if you just look down at verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one who's speaking to you, I am he. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you just help us now to understand your word given to us by the Holy Spirit. We thank you that it's here written for us, but we pray that these words would not just be ink on a page, but would come alive by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I who speak to you am he. According to John's gospel, who is the very first person that Jesus clearly revealed to I am the Messiah, an immoral Samaritan woman. This is remarkable. Do you know people, some of them are here in this church, I think. Do you know people that you would describe them as 
big hearted, warm hearted, especially open hearted people towards others, people that open their hearts up towards other people. I hope you do. Jesus, I hope you know Jesus because he's the most open hearted person that ever lived. I don't know about when your uh, childhood, when you went to the library and got books, but I used to often get Dr. Zeus books. Kind of, you know, how you memorize them and all that kind of thing. And so one of my favorite Dr. Zeus stories was How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I think that's the title. And, um, you know, the, we used to watch that little animated version when we were kids. We still actually do, it's tradition. But anyway, you know, how Dr. Zeus says, there was a problem with the Grinch. The reason he was so Grinchy was that his heart was two sizes too small. And that was why he was so awful to other people. Some people lived shriveled hearted living, closed hearted living, small hearted living. The realities are that if you want to simplify your life and not complicate it, then you should try small-hearted living, closed-hearted living, because it keeps you from a lot of complications and troubles in relationships, doesn't it? But Jesus points out that true living is not closed-hearted living. It's open-hearted living in a way that makes things complicated. This woman is trouble. And she's basically saying to him, why are you even talking to me? I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Jewish man. Why are we even talking? Jesus could have just left her alone. But he didn't. I'm convinced he went to Sychar to meet her. And because he wanted her to be the one to bear message and, and testimony of him into the village. And we read about that later in some wonderful applications here in this chapter. But Jesus complicated his life continually by being open-hearted towards others. And if you're going to be an open-hearted person like Jesus, you're going to find that you're going to end up with complicated, difficult situations where people will wound you as you open your heart to them. It happened to Jesus. It will happen to us. But what John's gospel is pointing out is open-hearted living, as complicated as it may be, is really living. It is the way our Savior lived and it's the way we're called to live i wonder what kind of heart do you have a few things i'd just like to look at quickly here in the passage first is in verses one to eight we should see here that an open heart of love reaches out to others despite exhaustion hunger and thirst if you would read with me verses six to eight jacob's well was there and jesus Tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said, Will you give me a drink? Thirst. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Why do you go into town to buy food in those days? You're out. They didn't exactly travel with fridges and stuff, right? So Jesus is hungry, he's thirsty. He's tired. Now, there's kind of a modern day expression we use. I don't know if you use it in your family called hangry. Have you ever come across the hangry expression? And basically, if I understand the way hangry gets used, it's something like this. If not eating causes me to be hangry, I'm not responsible for my actions and what I will do to people around me, right? Because I have a right to be hangry because I'm hungry. That's not the mentality of Jesus here. The other thing it says, he was exhausted. He was tired from the journey. Now, when I'm tired and exhausted, the other day I went climbing up the end of the cliffs in the Okanagan. And I was very tired afterwards. But when I'm very tired, if I haven't slept well, if I'm very wrecked, um, I can be very irritable. Right? Just ask my family. Uh, I can become harsh. I can become impatient. But here Jesus decides to step right into the heart of trouble because this woman is trouble while he's tired. And not only that, Jesus is thirsty. And I'm convinced that thirst, if you've experienced it, is the worst of the lot, right? I don't know if you've ever tried recovering from a surgery. Often when you recover, 
you're gasping for a drink. They won't usually give one to you until you come to fully, right? But Jesus is tired. He's hungry. He's thirsty. In our world, he has every excuse in the book not to open his heart to this kind of person. A person who's nothing like him. And here we see Jesus at his own cost open his heart to this woman. Another thing we see in verses 7 to 9 is that an open heart of love reaches out by crossing real and significant barriers. Crossing real and significant barriers. If you look at, with me at verses 9 and 10, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. An open heart of love reaches out across significant and real barriers. Very quickly here, the basic barrier between Samaritans and Jews, you may have heard before, was that of, I'm going to use the word hostility. And it was well-founded hostility historically. The Samaritans were the ones to, have cons- to be considered to have opposed Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall. It was considered the Samaritans were against them. Then when Antiochus came down and was trying to Hellenize the world, he came into Judea and he desecrated the Jewish temple. And guess who stood behind Antiochus as he did so? The Samaritans. Great anti- antagonism. It's about 150 years before Jesus meets this woman. Then around 100 years before Jesus meets this woman, along came the Maccabees and the tables turned. And so the Maccabean Jews, they marched on Samaria and they killed hundreds and slaughtered hundreds of Samaritans. And they leveled the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. It's being debated right here. Which, where do we worship? Which mountain? There is tremendous bitterness and hostility between these two peoples. We know of hostility in Ireland between different peoples and largely the political persuasions. We know of hostility even in this region of the world with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict today, right? Maybe that tells us the most because Sychar is actually in the city of Nablus, which is in the West Bank, disputed territory even today. But there was this ultimate animosity, narrow-mindedness between Jews and Gentiles. The Jews hated the Samaritans, particularly. They considered defiled a Samaritan house, a a seat that a Samaritan had sat on, an animal that had belonged to a Samaritan, a place where a Samaritan had laid. Cups and bowls and jugs were all considered unclean. And yet Jesus, a Jewish man, asked this woman, will you give me a drink? from your Samaritan vessel. Interesting. Not only that, but rabbis were quite known in those times to not bother with teaching women. Why would you teach women? It's just the mentality of the day. And yet here Jesus is willingly engaging with this woman and he knows she's trouble. There is no safe ground for this conversation and Jesus reaches across very real and significant barriers. There are many people today living in mission who've never really bothered to go to the trouble of crossing a significant barrier to open their heart to other people. I hope those people aren't here, but a lot of people live that way. But that's not Jesus. Jesus is willing to cross those barriers. Could I ask, would you like people to come in here to this church that are nothing like you? Really? Because that's the kind of scenario we're reading about here. And it's going to make life awkward and difficult. And yet Jesus reaches across these barriers to offer life to broken sinners. A third thing we see here is that an open heart of love invites ruined sinners to come to Jesus. Verses 16 to 19. It says, he told her, go and call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. 
The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. First, we need to notice here, Jesus doesn't avoid the issue of sin, does he? In fact, he goes straight for the core issue in this woman's life. And yet he does so because he has a willingness to offer life to her. He does not allow her sinful lifestyle to keep him from reaching out with this invitation to life. This woman is living in a world of sin. She's got her life in a bad place. She's desperate and she's trapped and she's ruined. We must make no mistake. She's ruined by her own sin. She's living in an immoral relationship. She's not married to the man she's with. And she is a woman who is broken because of her own sin. Well, something that I think that we often miss when we read this passage is this is also a woman who's broken by the sins of others. And it's wonderful to be here celebrating a marriage of faithfulness for 60 years. This woman knew nothing of such a thing. We don't know. It's possible that some of her husbands may have passed away. But overall, the picture seems to be one of this woman went through many divorces. And something we often don't read in, in, as reality is in these times, women did not have a place for divorcing men. Men got rid of their women. That's how it went. This woman, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> although she is broken by her own sin, she's also in ruins because of the sins of others against her. Her life is in tatters. And you know, as we work away in our end, we've come to realize that people are ruined by the sins they've chosen and the sins they're trapped in, but often they're also ruined because they've been sinned against. It's real. And that's this woman. She's a mess. But this is not too much for Jesus to reach out, to willingly offer life. She is trampled down. She's been crushed, worn out, feeling useless. It seems like the women of the village want nothing to do with her, and she wants nothing to do with them. Yet our Savior intentionally opens his heart to her to offer her life. This is so key for us to get. I don't know if there's anyone here who's struggling with the weight of their sin in this room, saying, listen, my sins are just too much for Jesus. Jesus willingly offers life to sinners like this woman, to us, that's us. But not only that, this is in definite contrast with the story of Nicodemus, who's this clean-living, self-righteous, religious man. And Jesus says to him, you cannot inherit eternal life. You must unless you are born again. You also need to receive life from me. It doesn't matter how clean-living you've been. You need life from me. All people, all the people of mission, all the people sitting here in this room, all the people across Canada, there is only one way to really have life, and it comes through the willing and open heart of Jesus. And there is no other way but that Jesus showed a willing and open heart. Because as we sit here, we can look at that immoral Samaritan woman and say, wow, that was amazing. Jesus saved someone like her. But we should be amazed that Jesus saved someone like me. Because Jesus did far more than go through hunger for us. Jesus laid down his life in our place. Jesus did far more than get tired for us. He poured out his blood for us. Jesus did far more then just get thirsty. In fact, on the cross, what does he cry as he bears our sin? I thirst. He knew thirst like no other man has known for us. In verse 10, Jesus says to this woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that speaks to you, you would have asked him and he would give you, have given you living water. 
Can I just finish with these words? Jesus said, if you knew. If you knew. Why is Jesus opening his heart to this woman? She needs to know that Jesus is God's Messiah. That Jesus is the one to give life. You know, what we need to take from this, I think, is quite clear. People must know who Jesus is. And that's why we're excited to be partnering with you in mission. That's why the people of this community, they need to know who Jesus is. And this is a challenge for us because people must know if they knew. Jesus willingly offers life to all who will put their trust in him. You know, one of the key things in this passage is that Jesus is taking step one outside of Jewish circles. In fact, when he gives the Great Commission in Acts to the disciples, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Jewish place, Judea, Jewish place, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Samaria was going to be step one to bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth, to places like BC, to places like Ireland. And this is wonderful because the reason that this gospel has come to us and we know about the glory of God and we know about who Jesus is, the reason is because our God is a big-hearted, open-hearted God who willingly holds out life to all who will believe. Thank you so much for having us with you. And thank you for letting us bring an update and for sharing. Um, and we're looking forward to the little celebration. Uh, here, so.